Simmons was often described as the man who made black urban culture a part of the mainstream. He was emerging as potentially the most credible and effective leader of the post-civil rights generation. That was until a scandal rocked the very foundation he built. Saying in a statement in part, I vehemently deny all these allegations. These horrific accusations have shocked me to my core and all of my relations have been consensual. And this video will chronicle his rise from the streets to the boardroom and also his disastrous fall from grace amid sexual misconduct allegations. Russell Simmons was born in 1957 in Jamaica, Queens. Both of his parents were graduates of Howard University in Washington, D.C. His father was a teacher who eventually became a professor of black history at Pace University. His mother worked for the New York City Parks Department as a recreation director. The Simmons family moved to the Hollis neighborhood of Queens when Simmons was eight years old. Their home was near a corner that was a known meeting place for drug users and dealers. He began selling marijuana while still in middle school, and for a time, was a member of a local gang called the Seven Immortals. When he was 16, he shot at someone who tried to rob him. He was arrested twice on other charges and received a term of probation. In 1975, when he was 18, Simmons tried to turn his life around and began taking classes at Manhattan City College. He found a job at an Orange Julius outlet in Greenwich Village. But at some point, he also financed his club-going lifestyle by selling fake cocaine. He believed if he was caught by the police, he wasn't doing anything illegal. But Simmons, of course, faced a bigger threat from angry customers. During these years, he hung out at the dance clubs of New York's outer boroughs where the music was predominantly disco. But then a new movement filtered in, one that had come out of the roughest Bronx and Harlem neighborhoods. Performers sang their own rhymes over a classic track, such as Flashlight from George Clinton. Simmons was at one such club in 1977 when he saw how wild the crowd went over one song from an early rapper named Eddie Chiba, and he decided that this was the sound of the future. His future. He started promoting concerts and then formed his own management company, which he called Rush Management, after his childhood nickname. The first track Russell produced was Christmas Rappin' by Curtis Blow. Some of the first rap songs ever played on the radio were from his ex. It was the group that his teenage brother Joey joined back in Hollis that put Simmons and his company on the map. Joey was the run in Run DMC, which had a spare hardcore style of rapping that was also full of clever humor and incisive social commentary. The group's first single, It's Like That, was released in 1983 and set the tone for the rest of the decade. Simmons helped make his brother's group immensely successful, especially after he teamed with white college student from Long Island, Rick Rubin, to launch Def Jam Records in 1985. I had gotten uh, a demo tape from a guy named uh, Ladies Love Cool J. And I brought it to play to Russell, and he loved him. He said, this is going to be, this is going to be a hit. It's great. They emerged as the first big players on the rap music scene. 
The label's first single was from LL Cool J, I Need a Beat, and helped bring Simmons and Rubin a distribution deal with CBS Records. The 1985 film Crush Groove was loosely based on Russell Simmons' life up until that point. It featured an array of top music acts from the era, from Run DMC and the Beastie Boys to LL Cool J and a young Bobby Brown when he was still a member of New Edition. It was directed by Michael Schultz, who made two earlier cinematic classics of African-American urban life, Cooley High and Car Wash. Simmons was one of the film's producers. Yo, cousin, me and you is all right, man. Why is he ill? Like, they gonna tear my yo, face man, yo, up, man. Yo, man, just get away from Start the show. I'll Over two decades after its release, Crush Groove has become a cult classic, a snapshot of the early days of rap music when culture, critics, and record company executives predicted the style was simply a fad. A then-unknown actor named Blair Underwood was cast in the role of New York City music promoter Russell Walker, owner of the label Crush Groove. The plot of the movie, however, was beside the point. Simmons wanted to showcase the array of young talent emerging from New York's black music scene and depict its vibrancy. During the mid-1980s, Simmons became known for his sharp ear and ability to predict the next big thing in music. He helped bring the Beastie Boys to a wider audience and even revived the careers of the fading rock act, Aerosmith. When Run DMC covered their 1975 hit, Walk This Way, the two groups even made a video together, which became a classic of MTV's first decade on the air. Simmons went on to shepherd such performers as Will Smith when he was still the rapper known as Fresh Prince as well as Public Enemy to mainstream success. But Simmons moved on to conquer audiences elsewhere, and it became one of the top-rated shows on HBO. What the f I know Big Bird out of business, but what the f Rush Communications became the umbrella group for all of Simmons' ventures. He launched the Deaf Poetry Jam, which was also carried by HBO and even became a Tony Award-winning Broadway show in 2003. Simmons sold his remaining stake in Def Jam in 1999 for $120 million. Four years later, his empire was estimated to be bringing in sales of $530 million annually. Much of that came from his clothing line, which he expanded with his then-wife, former model, Kimora Lee Simmons to include Baby Fat and Fat Farm Kids. They sold a stake in their company in early 2004 for $140 million in an attempt to bring it into more department and specialty stores. In 2017, the Me Too movement was gaining momentum and empowering women to speak out against their abusers. Several men in positions of power were taken down during this time. In November of that year, Simmons' first accuser came forward, stating that in 1991, she was raped by Simmons when she was just 17. On November 30th, another woman came forward, claiming Russell raped her as well in 1991 saying he offered her a ride home before the car doors locked and he allegedly took her to his own apartment where they had a sexual encounter that she says was non-consensual. In response to these allegations, HBO removed his name from the Def Jam franchise. Simmons also stepped down from a leadership role within his companies, stating, 
As the corridors of power inevitably make way for a new generation, I don't want to be a distraction, so I am removing myself from the businesses that I founded. The companies will now be run by a new and diverse generation of extraordinary executives who are moving the culture and consciousness forward. A third woman came forward with a similar story as the first two, and the three went on to recount their stories in a documentary titled On the Record. On the Record was originally slated for release on Apple TV Plus as part of Oprah Winfrey's multi-year deal with the streaming network. But as the New York Times reported ahead of the film's Sundance premiere, Winfrey parted ways with the project, citing creative differences with the filmmakers. She said, In my opinion, there is more work to be done on the film to illuminate the full scope of what the victims endured. And it has become clear that the filmmakers and I are not aligned in that creative vision. Winfrey, who has long been open about surviving sexual assault, emphasized that she was unequivocally believes and supports the women featured in the film, but she later acknowledged in another Times article that Simmons had pressured her to abandon the project. She also said Simmons and other unnamed people told her Dixon's account was not true, but stressed that her decision to pull her support was based on her sense that the film simply was not ready to be viewed by the public. The film premiered at the Sundance Film Festival and was subsequently picked up for distribution by HBO Max. At the time of this video, 10 women have come forward with stories of misconduct from Simmons. The NYPD has an open investigation on the allegations, but Simmons has not been officially charged with any crime. Simmons has repeatedly defended himself against these allegations, claiming he has taken several lie detector tests and have passed them all, although the results of the tests have never been made public. Simmons disappeared for a bit from the media and resurfaced in June of 2020. With an interview with The Breakfast Club, he revealed that he was living in Bali and building a school for yoga. Many people in the media are quick to point out that Bali doesn't have an extradition law and that Simmons is simply hiding there to avoid criminal charges. The documentary on the record was a critical hit and received a standing ovation at the Sundance Film Festival. It has also been a stepping stone for more black women to speak out about sexual abuse.